it's uh, my pleasure to have uh, an international capacity lecturer today, and he's going to talk about designing fire safety for tall buildings. Uh, so Jose Terrero, uh, he received his master's degree from uh, uh, in Lima, where he afterwards moved and uh, got a PhD from the University of Berkeley in California. Proceeded to move to Europe for a postdoc in France then went back to the United States and uh, worked there uh, and become uh, associate professor at the University of Maryland. Uh, currently, he's on sabbatical and he's at the uh, EPFL in Switzerland, but he's predominantly the last 10 years, he's been at the University of Edinburgh as a professor at the BRE Center for Fire Safety Engineering. So without further ado, uh, Jose Perot. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we're going to be talking about tall buildings, and can you all hear me properly? Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, tall buildings, in, when we deal with fire safety engineering, is one of the most misunderstood and confusing uh, terms that, uh, that anybody can uh, bring into the design process. Uh, I've been working with the International Council for uh, Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, heading their uh, fire safety group for the last almost four years now. Uh, and basically, we, every time we sit in a discussion, uh, no matter who is sitting around the table, there's always this big question about what are we talking about? And, uh, and that's the first issue that I think really needs to be addressed. That is a, 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 an element of great confusion uh, when addressing the problem of tall building, is what is a tall building? From a fire safety perspective, what would you label a building. If you had to define a tall building, what would be the criteria? Physical evacuation. Okay. Height. Height. What would be the limit? Four stories. How difficult has to be the evacuation? Okay, so one of the definitions, the classic definition, was the, if you take the firefighter's uh, equipment and you look into a ladder, you, know, you will define a certain height, which is the maximum possible reach for a firefighter. It varies among countries depending on the kind of equipment that you have, you know, 20 something meters, 30 meters, and that is a definition. But why is the ladder a meaningful definition for a tall building? Okay, so basically the, the ladder enables rescue operations from the outside, okay? And why is that important when we're dealing with, with buildings? And why, why is that meaningful when I design the strategy, the fire safety strategy for a tall building or for a building? Why is it meaningful that the ladder can reach or it cannot reach, enabling rescue from the outside? Because every opening is a possible exit. Okay, so basically it, it creates a possible exit. Now, that possible exit then becomes the redundancy to the proper building exit, no? So you have, for example, one stairwell that brings you down, and you can assume that the firefighters will enable a redundancy. So you have another means of evacuation. So for example, it can enable you to say that this building should have only one stair. Okay, so I can accept one stair because the firefighters provide the redundancy via the ladder. So that will be an argument, no? So that is a possibility that fundamentally enables me to reduce the egress paths internally because I am relying on what the firefighters can provide. Now, is that a property of the building itself? Not really. Basically, it will be linked into the capability that the firefighters have to intervene. No? So, for example, uh, the height of the ladder might be useless if the building doesn't have the right windows 
for the firefighters to be able to get people out. So once again, I'm running into that vague definition of what a tall building is. What about a building that really only opens to the inside, for example? There's some commercial buildings that for practical purposes, you know, you have neon lights or whatever on the outside, so they don't open to the outside. They only have windows looking to the inside, to a courtyard, where, for example, the fire truck cannot reach. In that case, would that be considered a tall building? You know, we might not label it a tall building, but philosophically, we will force to have a second path of egress, no? Because we need that redundancy. The basic principle of any safety process is to be able to have robustness and redundancy. So the solutions have to be robust, and therefore variants in the conditions can actually lead to the same outcome, and they have to be redundant. So if something fails, then something else can pick it up. So the definition of a tall building, even in its most basic concepts, is a very complicated one. Now, here we're talking about 20 meters or 30 meters. How many stories is that? You said about four. I would say maybe five or six, okay? Is that a tall building? It's all very relative, no? So would I change the considerations if it was not five or six, but it was 10? What's the difference between a 10-story building and a six-story building? In both cases, the firefighters cannot reach from the outside, so I don't have that alternate means of egress. Do I have to do special considerations for a 10-story building? Let's make it more extreme, 30. Now we're talking about 120, 130 meters. We've passed the barrier of the 100 meters in height. Do I have to do any special considerations? For example, Yeah, so the structural engineers will have all sorts of requirements. So they will say, yes, if you have a tall building, let's say 100 meters, then you have a different level of wind pattern. Basically, when you're on the ground level, you have a boundary layer type of flow. So fundamentally, the wind velocity is very low. You have a lot of blockage, and therefore you apply very small pressures, but as you're moving up, you're on a cantilever, and you're applying a pressure that is going up, and the profile is increasing. So I have standard ways of doing it, so there's equations for the wind profile that you apply on the load, or if your building has a funny shape or something, you will do a wind tunnel study, and you will apply pressure. So the structural engineers use some criteria that they have to define the need for a wind study on the basis of some wind profiles and on the basis of the kind of moments that are generating at a base because of the pressures that are applied by the wind. Now, give me a similar example for fire. That makes a different consideration for, you know, a 100 meter building as opposed to a 30s. Yeah. Okay, so this is one that is invoked very often, which is the time of evacuation. So, what would be rule of thumb? You know, what kind, what, more or less, what kind of time do you think it will take a typical office building with a reasonable floor plan, you know, something of the order of, I don't know, thousands of meters or something like that to evacuate? How long would you think it would take to get one floor empty? Order of magnitude. Hmm? If you go to a real extreme, maybe you can say four, five, six, seven minutes if you want. Um, rule of thumb typically is that about a typical floor will take about one minute, okay, to basically bring everybody out of the floor. Now, yeah, I mean, obviously the error bars are about this big, so I'm, I'm not going to debate the number, but let's just make a round easy number one, okay? So if you have a 10-story building, it takes you 10 minutes to bring everybody down. If you have a 30-story building, it takes you 30 minutes to bring everybody down or bring everybody into the stair, maybe, if you want to. But what's the difference? So from, from a safety point of view, what is the difference that it takes longer? Why does it mean anything to me? 
that's a very important point. So the structure has to be designed to maintain its integrity for a much longer period of time. But let's say it's an office, okay? And the office, an office building has, what, 40 kilograms per meter square of fuel, and the fuel is all going to burn out in about 20 minutes. So then, do I care if it takes me two hours to get everybody out? Is it a meaningful argument to say that length within the building is a way to, for me to classify you know, what a tall building is? Every floor is identical. If I'm designing an office building, every floor is identical. And every floor, more or less, will have the same amount of fuel. The fire in every floor will burn more or less the same amount of time. So I can say, well, if I guarantee you that the structure around every floor will prevent the fire from exiting that compartment, then it doesn't matter how tall the building is, no? Because the fire is confined. It will remain in there, burn for as long as it has to burn. It will consume itself. And then you have a building that is standing in place and everybody could be still in the stairs and it really doesn't matter. For all I know, I could do defending place and everybody could be in the building you know, and nothing happens. Would that be okay? Yeah, and if I box it in such a way that the smoke cannot get to the upper floor, then it's fine, no? You have to take into consideration the structural part in the case of the fire. Well, yes, I will always have to take into consideration the structural side, but I can always say that the fire didn't burn more than 15 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever minutes the fuel load to burn out, and then I can say that's what I need to consider. The structure has to withstand burnout. If something fails, hmm? if something fails like the, the fire will propagate in another room? Yeah, but that's what we're looking now into failure. Okay? Yes, obviously everything can always bring us to failure, and that is going to mess up our strategy. But when I design a strategy, I design the strategy in a robust and redundant way so that I can guarantee myself that I have a minimum probability of failure. Okay? But before I start designing, I want to set my bounds. And I want to understand really what is a tall building. Okay? And I'm still kind of debating if we actually have to find a tall building or not. Yes, I mean, obviously, people are difficult to manage, okay? Especially in the case of an emergency. And of course, you have to design a system in such a way that you can take into account that. Now, many engineers will argue that the job of an engineer is to engineer out human behavior from the picture, okay? It's like a car. You know, when you drive a car, do you think every time you put the gears? No, the, the people that design the gearbox engineered you out of the picture. Millions of people drive cars and nobody thinks when they're shifting from first to second gear exactly what they're doing, okay? Basically, everybody is behaving in exactly the same way. And of course, fire is a lot more complicated than that. You know, it's not about hitting the, the right pedal when you're putting gas or you're braking, you know, which is basically engineering human behavior out of the picture. But nevertheless, our hope and our aim is to be able to design a system that is robust enough, that is resili resilient to the stupidity of the human being. Do we agree? Okay, that is our objective. And, but nevertheless, that doesn't help me to define what a tall building is. Yes, I need to consider all these human factors because I need to design in a robust way. Yes, I need to consider the structural behavior because I need to design for somehow burnout. 
Okay? You know, yes, I need to consider the ladders because that's a means of egress, but once I go beyond the ladder, are all buildings the same? Okay, this is the way we thought in 1906. Okay? Exactly the exercise we just went through was the exercise that people went through in 1906. Okay? Steel and concrete were entering the picture as very robust, well-characterized to the time, materials that enabled the construction of tall buildings. Okay? This is where the first thoughts come up, and everybody starts thinking, ooh, but what about fire? There was a number of major fires that had killed a lot of people uh, in different countries that basically had instated in people this fear that what will happen if a, a tall building catches on fire. So then, what was the logic behind it? How do I stop thinking about the problem? Okay. First of all, I'm going to decide what my fire is going to be. So I did a whole bunch of tests. You had people, had a compartment, and they were throwing as much wood as they could to create the hottest possible temperature. Okay? They tried different ventilations, they tried different amounts of fuel, different amounts of fuel rates, different types of compartment, and they kept throwing the things until they got these fires. Okay? What did they establish? Temperatures as a function of time. How the temperature increased and decreased as a function of time. They established also how long would it take to burn the wood. Okay? So depending on the kilograms of wood they were putting in, they knew how long the fire was going to be. Okay? So on that basis, they formulated a standard fire. And they said, what is the worst, worst, worst possible scenario? Make the fire as hot as possible. So they took all the curves that they could find, and they created an envelope. Okay? So the envelope was the worst possible fire that they could get. Somebody in their mind had thought that they could achieve 1,200 degrees Celsius. Okay? No matter what they did, they never did. You know, they were throwing wood like crazy, but they could not get to 1,200. So the curve goes to infinity, but approaches almost asymptotically that magic 1,200 value. So you have this curve that goes like this. That is your fire load. Okay? So that's the load you're imposing in the building. Okay? And then basically, you're saying, okay, if I give this load for how long until burnout? Okay? So they calculated, depending on the kilograms of wood available, and that's where the wood equivalent comes from. So basically, on the, on the number of wood that was, or the amount of wood that was available, they established how long would it take to burn out the fire. Okay? So if I design for the worst fire for the longest period of time possible, would my structure be okay? Yes? Are we happy with that concept? Yeah? Can it be worse? Seriously, can it be worse? You have no confidence. I'm telling you it's the worst possible fire for the longest period of time. Can it be worse? No. Okay? End of the story. So I'm happy. No matter what you do in that building, so long you maintain the fuel load, you know that there cannot be a hotter fire for a longer period of time. So then I construct a furnace. Okay? I put it in a lab, and I take my elements, and I test them. And they have to resist until all the fuel burns out. Okay? So we were designing from day one for burnout. So fires were designed for burnout, end of the story, with the worst possible fire, end of the story. Okay? Now, but that was not enough. See, structural engineers had understood a little bit about the mechanics of buildings. So they say, well, okay, but that's all fine, but I'm testing a single element, and I'm defining a failure of that single element when that single element loses its mechanical properties. The materials deteriorate, and you start losing mechanical properties until eventually you lose all your safety factors. They established that something conservative was 
So once you lose half of the strength, then the material is gone. You can assume it's gone. That was conservative because at the time, the safety factors were four, five, six. Okay, so it was a conservative decision again, but basically was based on a single element. So you had one single element that was defining the behavior of the entire building. That's risky, no? So how do you fix that problem? From a structural perspective. I'm extrapolating, no? Because I'm testing one element and I'm assuming the whole structure behaves that way. Okay, so what I do is I create the concept of the compartment fire. So I create a box and I put walls and I can guarantee the fire doesn't leave that compartment. Okay, so create the concept of compartmentalization. Okay, so you box the fire now to a compartment. Okay, once you box the fire into a compartment, you guarantee that your structural system, generally at the time was made out of frames, has enough restraint on the structure, basically is holding the structure in place, that if this piece fails and the structure is trying to be pulled inwards because this is failing, it distributes the loads through a number of other paths and it redistributes them along the structure because everything is kept in place by means of restraint. If the structure tries to expand and pushes, the restraint okay, is going to carry the loads to the rest of the elements, you create redundant paths and everything gets distributed. In other words, introducing restraint into the building isolates that bay from the rest of the building. I can fail this component completely and all the loads will be redistributed. Okay? So think of the concept then. Box, fire in a box, worst case scenario fire, put it in there for the longest period of time, okay? And guarantee that you have a structure that is redundant enough that it provides full restraint or a very high level of restraint, you know, for your system so that the loads get redistributed in a coherent way. Okay? Now, what did we do when we created that? What was the conclusion of that? The tall building disappeared. The tall building was guaranteeing that the fire stays in a box, that you have restraint. And if I put this in the first floor, in the 10th floor, in the 100th floor, it doesn't matter. It will never fail. Can it fail? No, I can't. You know, basically, I've created a system that is foolproof. Now, of course, then I have to put the fire protection in there, no? So I have to make sure that I evacuate everybody, but I don't have to bring them down. So my maximum egress paths now become from the floor to the stair, and the stair becomes the safe environment. How do I make the safe environment in the stair? I box it. Compartmentation doesn't allow the smoke to get to the stair, doesn't allow the flames to get to the stair. Problem solved. So by creating the stair as a safe environment, I disappeared the concept of the tall building. Okay? So for 100 years, we've lived with this. Every country in the world has at least one major testing facility where we do testing for structural elements, Okay? We rate them on the basis of that. We all use the same standard temperature time curve. For years, we've had the same criteria of compartmentation. You know, and basically, we have lived with that to the point that there's no need for engineering anymore. Okay? Basically, the entire concept of fire safety rested in the hands of the architect. Why? Because all the architect had to guarantee was the fireproofing and the compartmentation. Okay? So if they follow a set of very specific rules that basically enable them to guarantee compartmentation, all very standardized, we gave them the rules, they check the box, done. And if they fireproof the structure, they delayed the failure to where I want it to be, burnout, okay? done. Okay? 
So engineering disappeared from the face of the earth in everything that concerned structural behavior uh, in fire, and tall buildings didn't exist as a fire concept at all. Okay? There was absolutely no reason to think of a tall building as a tall building, because literally all it was was a flat floor where I had to bring people to save egress into a stair. So tall buildings became fundamentally the design of a stair. Okay? We standardized the design of a stair, gave it to the architect again, the entire responsibility was with the architect. Okay? That's implicit performance, no? Because once I have everything standardized, everything normalized, a 10-story building, an 80-story building, a 100-story building, and the Burj Al Khalifa, you know, which is 840-something meters in height, they're all the same. Doesn't make any difference whatsoever. And of course, through the years, people got a little bit worried. You know, buildings were getting very tall, they were very close to each other, all sorts of other things. Some people start thinking, well, there's sort of a risk type aspect of it. Then what is the problem? Well, when you have a very tall building, a lot of things can go wrong because people are accumulating in the stair. You know, so they start creating redundancy, redundancy, redundancy all over the place. Let's put sprinklers on every single building. You know, all these redundancies are being added all over the place to protect the life safety. What about the structure? Did anything change with the analysis of the structure? Since 1906, when we started burning wood to establish what the worst possible fire, until 1918, when we standardized the first standard temperature time curve, until the 21st century, did anything change with the structure? Have any idea? No. Okay, you can say it. You know? It's good to start by actually confessing our sins. We did not change anything. Because we didn't. We didn't need it. There was no need. Why would we change anything? We had solved the problem. Worst possible fire, longest possible time, box everything, so that I can test everything in a standard furnace. Simplify the calculations to the level where you didn't need to spend money on an engineer, and let the architect just prescribe everything. The structural engineer had absolutely no responsibility for life safety. None. Zero. OK? The structural engineer actually did not even have to think about it. He designed in cold. Gave it to the architect. The architect slapped the insulation. End of the problem. Done. OK? And then this happened. A hundred years later, when our entire safety framework was established, all of a sudden we got that. Whose fault was it? Minoru Yamasaki, the architect, or Leslie Robertson, the structural engineer? Who goes for the structural engineer? Nobody. One person. Who goes for the architect? One person. <laughs> Who thinks it's a conspiracy theory run by the North American government to invade Iraq? <laughs> Everybody. You see, that's irrational thinking. Okay. Conspiracy theories are basically the excuse that we have for our ignorance, okay? But n neither you, no, none of you are really willing to step up and say it was the structural engineer's fault or it was the architect's fault. Why well, wasn't one or the other? The structural engineer's fault, it was not. Why? Because he was never asked to calculate it. He wasn't even asked to look at it. It was not even part of the list of things he was asked to explore. Leslie Robertson was asked to smash a plane into that building and see if it could mechanically withstand the loads. It did. Okay? He was asked to perform the most comprehensive wind tunnel analysis ever conducted for pressures on these buildings. He did. Never had a problem with wind. He was even asked to, def to design a building that was for equivalent seismic activity than Northern California. Okay, in an area where there's no earthquake. 
and he did. And this building performed brilliantly to everything he was asked. So in September 12, when he was asked, what happened here? He was like, it's not my fault. You know, I was never asked to look into this particular scenario. I mean, Minoru Yamazaki was dead, so unfortunately, there was no way to ask him. But the truth is that even the architect, what did the architect do? He followed the rules to perfection. Yes, people will argue that the quality of the fireproofing was not right, that some of them had fallen off, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, fair enough. You know, all these things are somehow real. But to what extent the responsibility of this relies on those mistakes, that's something that is very easy to prove that is actually minor. This was a global collapse. It was not a local failure. Okay? If one of the trusses would have failed, the building would have not come down. If one entire floor would have failed, the building would have not come down. Even if half of the columns were severed, this building was so redundant and distributed the load so perfectly well. He had this massive top hat truss that would carry everything to the other side, that the building was actually very stable after the impact of the airplanes. Okay? So minor mistakes, yes, accelerated the failure, but they were not the mechanism that brought the building down. It was the architect at fault? No, he followed the rules. And fundamentally, he did not have the knowledge to know any better. Okay? Nobody told the architect what did it really mean to, did, to do what he did. He just prescribed the fireproofing according to, remember, the worst possible fire for the longest period of time, you know, under conditions that were deemed to be perfectly restrained. Okay? Although the restraint aspect had been forgotten by the time. It was an assumption that was embedded in original thinking, but it was sort of carried through the codes, but never really verified in a correct way. This building was never verified to be fully restrained. It was assumed to be fully restrained. Okay? So, Whose fault was it? One person followed the codes and accepted a proper implicit performance. The building was supposed to behave correctly. That's what the code says. I mean, that's it, no? The code says, if I follow the rules, the building will stay there until burnout. Is that the case? Well, then you will argue, well, but there was breach of vertical compartmentation because of the aircraft. So the fire was three stories. What does the code say about that? It doesn't say, because the code requires you to create vertical compartmentation so you have a single floor fire. Does, does that, that's what the reason that brought the building down? We don't know because performance was implicit. Okay? You had a big hole in there, and the building was open floor plan. So there was no compartmentation, so the building heated up with a traveling fire that moved around the building for about an hour. So you didn't have only one compartment or one sector heated, one bay that could redistribute the loads to the side, but you had actually the whole floor that was heating and cooling as the fire was traveling around. Was that what brought the building down? We don't know because nobody ever assessed the performance. It was implicit. So nobody did anything about it. So I wouldn't know. So you had all these little things that were in there and you were wondering, no? Was that the problem? But nobody did it. Nobody looked at this particular problem. So this is really one of the big lessons that we learned here, no? You know, basically, if we extract the 10 years of thinking about World Trade Center, and when I talk about World Trade Center, I put this photograph here because this is the third building, okay? And the third building is World Trade Center 7, and that building collapsed too, and here you have a fire perfectly compartmentalized as per the code required. It doesn't go up, it doesn't go down, okay? The floor plans were actually not open floor. They were actually partitioned, but the partitions were actually quite big in surface area. It was not the small four by four by four compartment in which they did the original test. It was about 10 by 15 or something like that by four or five in height. 
And it had very funny false ceilings, so the fires actually penetrated through the false ceilings. Okay? So actually, the fires did travel very slowly around the building. But it was more or less compartmentalized. It never went down. It never went up. It was localized in here. Nevertheless, the building came down. And of course, the claim is, well, the sprinklers didn't work. Is that the reason? Where in the intentions of the structural design somebody talked about sprinklers? When the architect was told, this is a fireproofing that you have to put, was there any mention of sprinklers? Yeah, in some cases, we do it as a trade-off. This is what the code wants, and we can put the sprinklers and go one step less. Okay? We can discuss that later. But in this particular case, they didn't do it. They just went with the standard fireproofing required for a perfectly restrained assembly. Okay? They compartmentalized vertically, and they put some level of compartmentation horizontally. But by then, in the 1970s, the code had forgotten about the compartmentation. So we were doing floor plan left and right, open floor plans. So why did the building come down? It was designed correctly, no, for burnout, but it came down. So when you start thinking of the lessons, you really have to think of really what we learned out of this. What do you think is the main and most important lesson that you learned out of Walter Center? Very conceptual. Yes. Well, it's your job to predict it. If you stand up and say, well, the safety of everybody in this room is an aleatory problem, and basically I have nothing to do to fix it. You are all going to die. <laughs> I cannot do that. My job as a fire engineer is to be able to predict the consequences of my design so that you can walk into that building in entire confidence that you will walk out alive. Is that okay? So I can predict in principle, or at least I thought I could. It was an implicit level of safety. We did everything we had to do, and the expectation was it is safe. But what, would, what, what, what happened there? What is the biggest lesson that you can extract from the whole set of failures of the World Trade Center? And don't tell me that the American government is evil. So what's the biggest lesson? Okay, so you cannot necessarily count on implicit level of safety. That was obvious. No? That's what comes out straight to your face. But what does that mean for the structural engineer? If you cannot assume that because you put fireproofing and you test the elements in a furnace that the building is going to stand until burnout in a building that is going to be full of people okay, that has been sitting in a stair for probably at least one hour in a 50-story building. Okay? So what does that mean for the structural engineer? Yes? Well, if the structural engineer is required to take fire as a separate load to assess structural behavior, what that really fundamentally means is that the structural engineer now has responsibility for life safety. Is that okay? That is the fundamental lesson. Until then, we believed in what we had, and we assumed that tall buildings didn't exist. They were a figment of our imagination that was narrowed down by a set of very simple prescriptive rules into a single floor fire that could be easily managed where a structural problem could not potentially exist. So that put the structural engineer out of business in fire. They had nothing to do. But the main and fundamental reason or le lesson that you learn from World Trade Center is that actually when you get these particular buildings,
that start breaking to a lower or greater extent the original 1906-1918 rules. Okay? When you start getting open floor plans, when you get the potential for upward-downward propagation, when you get all these different things happening, then what happens? The structural engineer becomes responsible. Okay? Anytime you move out of the completely rigid set of rules that were the original basis of that code, then the structural engineer has to take some level of responsibility. Now, does that make meaningful the height of the building? From a structural perspective. Let me throw the question upside down. If you take a tall building that is 50 stories in height, is the bottom floor the same as the top floor? No, even if the floor plan is identical, no? Why not? Exactly. So basically, you have to maintain the utilization level of the structural elements. No? So as you move down and you get more weight, your structural elements start changing. Okay? So if the structural engineer has to verify the behavior of the building, okay, because we're breaking the rules and we're not anymore in that confinement, then as the structure becomes taller, its evolution is decided by the structural engineer no? on the basis of many criteria. You know, today we have all these funny twisted buildings and all these really strange things. And what do we do? We create 100 meter long columns that are not anymore vertical, they're tilted. The longer we make them, probably the bigger of a problem we create. You know, we do all sorts of very strange things for the purpose of optimization that transform the building as it's moving up. And uh, designing a 10-story building is a completely different process than designing a 200-meter building because it's a completely different optimization process. I'm not going to use the same floors. I'm not going to use the same columns. I'm not going to use the same structural systems. You know, the way I optimize for wind loads changes the shape sometimes. In the Burj Al Khalifa, the building changes shape as you move up. Why? Because the windows have to change and they have to optimize them as they move up. And because the owners, they don't want to make their mind <clears throat> of how tall the building was going to be. So the engineers were already building the building and they were saying, eh, add another 20 meters. And when they were in the 30th floor, add another 30 meters. So they had to, to maintain the foundations of the building working correctly. They have to change all the shapes and change the cladding and all that so that the wind loads will be minimized. Okay? So the, the height now starts becoming an incredibly important variable of the problem. And it forces us to think of tall buildings in a completely different way. So the problem is beginning to get complicated, no? Now, tall buildings are now becoming, each of, and every single one of them, a prototype. And that's an important lesson that we learned with World Trade Center. World Trade Center was not a standard building. It was a prototype. And we did it for wind, for earthquake, for airplane impact, for everything as a prototype. But when it dealt with fire, we dealt with it as a standard building. Huge mistake. It was not a standard building. So a very unique prototype. So tall buildings, the taller they get, the more they become prototypes. So a fire safety analysis cannot be standardized. You cannot use the same size to fit every one of these tall buildings. Very important lesson. And as you see, every time we're going explicit versus implicit. If the structural engineer is going to take responsibility, he will have to do an explicit analysis. And he cannot rely on the implied performance. If the building is a prototype, it cannot be standardized. So it is not explicit. It is explicit and not implicit. Furthermore, here we have a very big problem. Because how many structural engineers did we have that could understand the structural behavior in fire? How many architects could understand the impact of the decisions that were being made in the structural design on the performance of fireproofing? In everything that concerns structural fire engineering, we had educated and trained people and accredited people to be code consultants. <laughs> 
Okay? They were not engineers. All they were doing was consulting on how to better apply the standardized implicit solution. So World Trade Center taught us that our entire educational framework, our entire accreditation process in what concerned structural fire analysis was flawed. To the point that when we actually had to do the investigation, we didn't have the skills to investigate the failure. You know, it took seven or eight years for the American government to do its investigation, and the investigation leaks everywhere you look at it. Now, do I blame them? No. They went as far as they could possibly go. But we had never developed the tools to actually do a proper structural fire analysis because we never needed it. We were working on a perfectly prescriptive framework that had worked for us to perfection. Okay? So as you can see, these are massive lessons that we learned out of World Trade Center. They're not the details. Yes, we learned a lot about connections. Yes, we learned a lot about long spans. You know, we learned a lot about the impact of asymmetries in building design. We learned a lot about stability of columns. You know, we learned a lot about the fire itself and how it can propagate. We've developed methodologies to assess traveling fires. All these technical details we've learned. Lesson after lesson after lesson we've learned from World Trade Center. But the big lessons are these three. Basically, we're ignorant. We are standardizing the unstandardizable. And fundamentally, our structural engineers have released a responsibility that belongs to them. Okay? So if we're going to build tall buildings, we better train structural engineers to have, take that responsibility and address the buildings in an explicit manner as necessary for any prototype. Okay? Now, should I be classifying now buildings on the basis of their height? Big question, Martin. No? If I think about it from the perspective of the structural engineer, then in principle, I should classify the buildings in two types. Those that are perfectly compliant, perfectly standardized, little frames, boxes, fully compartmentalized, with nothing all to them, doesn't matter what height they are, and then all the others. No? Now, from the basis of the fire protection, how we design the stairs, how we pressurize them, you know, how we put the sprinklers, no sprinklers, sprinklers, you know, smoke detection, all these things, that's a slightly different story. Okay? But from the basis of the fire safety, the structural fire safety, then the classification is perfectly clear. It's standard and non-standard. And standard is very rigid. You know, it is the way we design the Empire State Building. The Empire State Building is a bunch of little boxes put one on top of each other. Okay? And they're all perfectly compartmentalized. And the building literally cannot propagate a fire unless everything really goes wrong, in which case maybe we're in the tail of our problem. So, let me move on. Here is your big lessons and see how we apply them. Yeah. So, basically, this is a conclusion. And it's really not necessarily a lesson, but a conclusion of this, which is basically when we're dealing with fire, and I put it here so that you keep that in mind, but you will see why I'm adding this in here. Today we're talking a lot about sustainable infrastructure, and sustainable infrastructure, from my perspective, from the perspective of fire, it is basically knowing today you know, what the consequences of your actions will be for tomorrow. Okay? Exactly what you were saying we should not be doing. You know, basically, we cannot treat fire as an aleatory problem and assume to see what's going to happen. No, we have to explicitly understand you know, what the impact of the fire is going to be. Okay? So it's extremely important to be able to understand that, and that is dealing with tall buildings in a sustainable way. And basically, this is one that fundamentally, when we're dealing with tall buildings, we need to forget about. Okay? Fundamentally, we cannot put our focus on losses. Yes, I know fire safety engineering is about safety, it's about preventing human and property losses. Okay? Or minimizing them if you want to be more soft. Okay? But that's what it's all about. But we cannot focus on this. Why we cannot focus on this? Because this is our biggest limiting element. Because the current situation 
is that life losses in fire are very small compared to any other disaster. They're negligible. And when you're dealing with tall buildings, it's even more negligible. Okay? We, buildings are not falling from the sky every day. Okay? In the last 10 years, there's been about eight or nine of them that have, have major failures in tall buildings. So compared to you know, hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, this is absolutely negligible. Okay? So if we focus on this, basically we don't have a problem to address. Tall buildings are not a problem, despite the fact that we have the obvious reference to the World Trade Center. Furthermore, financial losses. It's not a problem at all. We need enough fires so that the insurance companies can make money. Okay? So we have those. And then we don't need too many because then they start losing money. And we don't have too many. So at the end, the financial losses in, in fire are very small. And when you deal with tall buildings, are absolutely negligible. Tall buildings are not a financial problem. So if our losses are very small and our financial losses are very small, then how can we justify any change? Why don't I just keep doing things exactly the way I did them? Okay, I gave you an example of World Trade Center. Something went wrong. But that, that does mean that I need to change. And this is the key, no? Do we need any change? Should we just be happy with the way we do things, forget about tall buildings, and assume our acceptable losses are negligible compared to everything else? You know, most people in fires die at home smoking their cigarettes in bed. Social problem, not a technical problem. Okay? Tall buildings don't fail. Most of them are all in place. So at the end of the day, I can just basically stop and say, well, fine, World Trade Center happened, let's forget about it. Conclusion, the terrorists did it, it will never happen again. Okay? So I'll leave you with that reflection point for a break, and then I'll pick up from there. <laughs>